Hi, I'm Dr. Jared Gardner, and I'm going to share an interesting case with you today. Uh, this is a punch biopsy from a, a plaque, an erythematous red plaque that had little pustules in it clinically. I don't have the photo to show you, but but it was on the extremity, um, uh, the, the thigh of a, of a middle-aged woman. And uh, when I per first put the, the biopsy down, you can see there's a lot of inflammation around hair follicles and sebaceous glands. And there's also some spongiosis and inflammation up here, some edema. So uh, clinically, the story is that this patient uh, went to an urgent care. Uh, the, the person at the urgent care thought that they maybe had um, varicella zoster uh, shingles and gave them some uh, anti, anti zoster um, antiviral medication, but it didn't get better. Supposedly, the patient's been putting some, some uh, lotions on it, but um, but no mention of applying or trying topical steroids. Although I suspect, based on what we find the answer to be, that maybe they actually have applied some topical steroids to this. So uh, looking deeper, I mean, you can see zoster with this kind of inflammation, but I didn't see any herpes viral cytopathic effect when I looked here. But zoster also often does get brisk inflammation around hair follicles and sebaceous glands, usually with necrosis of the sebaceous gland. Zoster can also get a lot of inflammation, lichenoid inflammation, spongiosis, epidermal ulceration and necrosis. So sometimes you can see all of those things um, without actually seeing the viral uh, cytopathic effect of herpes. So I thought, my first thought is I'm going to do deepers and maybe do uh, herpes stains to make sure there's not zoster here. Uh, because the patient, again, was given the anti-herpes antiviral medication, but, um, but no one had ever swabbed the lesion and checked it by PCR to see if it was actually herpes zoster. Okay. So I thought, let me look closer. I don't see any, any zoster. What I see is a lot of spongiosis, a lot of lymphocytes, tons of lymphocytes uh, with exocytosis into the epidermis, like you could see in spongiotic dermatitis. Ah, look, not only do we have lymphocytes around the outside of the follicle and sebaceous gland, but in the middle, we have neutrophils. Well, that's what you'd see in like bacterial folliculitis, for example, or, or any sort of uh, suppurative pus producing folliculitis. There's a bunch of neutrophils. There's also Langerhans cells here. So I thought, well, maybe we could do bacterial stains to see. There's another follicle involved. So this one also has neutrophils all the way down into sebaceous gland itself. And another one, and you can tell it's a hair follicle because look, there's a little hair shaft right there, that little refractile bit that's popping out of the, the plane of section when we focus in and out. And sometimes inflamed follicles, both the regular folliculitis and also uh, when you get lymphocytes around follicles, for some reason, Langerhans cells, these gray guys right here, they love to clump up in hair follicles. I'm not exactly sure why, but I see that uh, quite a bit in inflamed hair follicles from a variety of different causes. So the main question is, we do have some folliculitis, but clinically, this didn't look like your usual folliculitis, you know, multiple erythematous papules with pustules scattered around based on hair follicles. Instead, this was one single plaque that almost looked like psoriasis a little bit. So with, with some pustules in it, uh, there was also the clinical question of, you know, could this be herpes zoster, even though it didn't really look quite right for zoster. So I'm going to show you what the actual answer is. Oh, look, the blue dot sign. So I added that blue dot. Uh, uh, the slides, unfortunately, do not come labeled with dots that show us the important findings. We have to figure out where those findings are. So it's subtle, but if you look closely here, you can see the answer. And sometimes you're lucky and you can see it on the regular H&E stain. Other times I have to do special stain to find these. But usually if you look carefully, you can find them or at least get a hint of them. Uh, unfortunately, this is one of those things I can see better under my microscope than you can see here. But right here in the stratum corneum, right there and there, those are the cross sections of fungal hyphae. There's a little, the little purple dot is kind of the cytoplasm in the middle. And then there's a little clear refractile wall. Again, my camera, unfortunately, as good as it is, is just one of these things that it does not pick up well. And I had to really look carefully to find them. So now I'm seeing fungus, fungal hyphae up there. So this is uh, tinea, dermatophytosis or tinea, also uh, known to, to non-medical people as ringworm, even though it has nothing to do with worms. It's just a, a superficial fungus infection that involves the skin surface. And sometimes it can go down inside hair follicles. So it's not really like invading the body, per se, but it's involving the inside, the lumen of the hair follicle, the part where the hair shaft is. So now that I found the fungus up top, I know that must be what's causing this folliculitis. This is fungal folliculitis uh, or dermatophytosis.
mitosis involving hair follicles. And when the hair follicles get involved, the term that we use for this is mayaki granuloma or majoki, majaki is what it looks like, M-A-J-O-C-C-H-I. But I think the, the proper pronunciation is mayaki, or at least that's how I've been taught. I've, my apologies to Dr. Mayaki if I'm pronouncing the name wrong. Uh, if you want to see how to spell it, look in the, the title of this video. Uh, in any case, so when we have that, sometimes the follicle will actually rupture and produce granulomas in the dermis around it. Uh, theoretically, the fungus could get out into the granulomas, although I almost never see that. Usually when I see what clinically looks like Mayaki granuloma, microscopically what I see is inflamed hair follicles with fungus in the hair follicle lumen. All right. It is important when we when I see a dermatophyte of any sort, even if they weren't thinking about hair follicle involvement, I usually want to look carefully to see if I can find any fungus in hair follicles because when we have fungus on the skin surface, it can usually be treated with a topical antifungal cream, okay? But once the hair follicles get involved, once the fungus goes down deeper, because look how much deeper this follicle is than the skin surface. It's way down there. So if there's fungus way down here inside the follicle, putting creams on the surface will kill these, these fungus up here, but it may not be effective at killing all of the deeper fungus in the hair follicle. So oftentimes uh, those patients need oral antifungal therapy to make sure that all of the fungus, including the fungus down in the hair follicle gets uh, killed. So that's why I, I like to look and specifically comment on this when I'm looking for a fungus and I find dermatophyte, I, I usually like to specifically comment on whether or not I see hair follicle involvement, but especially so if there is folliculitis or if they clinically are, are thinking of this. So I did a fungal stain for teaching purposes here. Let me show you uh, what we see. And remember, I could just show those very rare fungus on the H&E, but look at how many there are once we do the GMS stain. So this is Gamoria methanamine silver or GMS. It's a silver stain that highlights fungus. You could use PAS stain, periodic acid shift stain to do the same thing. It would make the fungus look like bright pink. Uh, I think in, in my laboratory, the GMS stain is a little cleaner and uh, prettier and it makes the fungus really stand out. And look at them. You can see the black fungal hyphae here and they're wrapped all around the outside of this little tiny hair shaft. The little uh, yellow thing in the middle is a hair shaft. This whole structure is the hair follicle. And then the keratin that's uh, around the outside of the hair shaft is where all these fungal hyphae are. So you can see them, they're all wrapped around the follicle. We also kind of got lucky here that we just got a perfect section showing this part of the follicle that's involved. Deeper down, most of this stuff is just debris from the neutrophils. Neutrophils and the fragments of nuclear debris from the neutrophils exploding, uh, which is what they do to try to destroy infectious organisms. Uh, the neutrophil nuclei often pick up a little bit of GMS. So GMS can kind of be a dirty stain that's sometimes hard to interpret when there's a lot of necrosis or a lot of inflammation around. So with practice, you learn how to do it because fungus has a very, the fungal organisms, yeast and hyphae, they have a very uniform shape and size usually and they're very strongly staining, whereas the debris in the background is just like little specks and dots of all different size and shape. So uh, when you're first starting out in pathology, it's kind of hard to learn what stuff is a, when something's on a stain, what is a real stain, what is meaningful, and what's just junk or debris. That's true for special stains like GMS. It's true for immunostains also. So learning what staining to ignore and what staining is real is a, is an important part of the job of a pathologist learning what matters and what doesn't. Okay, so in here, that's mostly junk, but I think there was also some follicle way down here at the bottom. Look, there's a hyphae right there, and there's a hypha right there, and there might even be like a little spore or canidia up there, or maybe it's a cross section of hypha. I can't tell. So uh, these are these are multiple fungal hyphae, and so these are dermatophyte fungus, um, and there are a few different species of that that can cause. Uh, tinea, or also known as, again as dermatophytosis or ringworm. And then look, they're also present up here in the surface. Now, sometimes I see them uh, just in hair follicles and not on the surface. And sometimes I see fungus just on the surface and not involving hair follicles. But there you go. They're, they're up there in the stratum corneum. And it's just a good reminder to always think about fungus because the big thing is this going to get treated differently than most inflammatory. A lot of inflammatory skin conditions are treated with steroids, topical corticosteroids, which what do they do? They knock down the immune system to try to calm the inflammation. 
Well, you know, the inflammation, part of its job is to try to destroy fungus. So if you wipe out the inflammation in a inflammatory dermatosis, a rash, okay, fine, that, that's good. But if you knock down the inflammation in someone who has an infection, like dermatophyte fungus, it can make the fungus grow out of control. It's like, we jokingly say it's like fertilizer for the fungus. It's probably not actually helping the fungus itself, but it is taking away the immune system from fighting against the fungal organisms. So a lot of times if you um, mistakenly uh, see a person that has dermatophyte infection clinically and, in not, and don't recognize that it's fungus and you give them steroids to put on the, the rash, the rash will get worse. And part of what happens is that the fungus tends to get driven down. It grows down into the hair follicles and produces the fungal folliculitis or Miyake granuloma. Um, and so again, that's then harder to treat. The other thing that happens is clinically what, you know, usually dermatophyte looks kind of like a ring shape that has like a trailing bit of scale and a red raised edge and a cleared uh, center. If you look up pictures of ringworm or, or tinea online, you can see some examples of that. If you want to see what a clinical photo looks like, but if you treat dermatophyte fungus with topical steroids, not only do you have a higher chance of getting hair follicle involvement, but also the rash begins to look unusual clinically. And it doesn't look like the typical ringworm annular ring-like shape with the scale. It can become a th thick, solid plaque. It can become patchy. It can have a weird, I've seen a, when I was in fellowship, I saw a case with these weird polycyclic figure eight ring-like arrangement, really wild looking. So that's called tinea incognito. So it's tinea that is in disguise. It clinically doesn't look like tinea anymore. And then it becomes even harder to make the diagnosis clinic because it doesn't have the classic ring shape. So I haven't seen patients actually that for multiple years were misdiagnosed diagnosed and mistreated clinically because they had something that was actually fungus, but was thought to be a rash and their, their doctor or their treating provider uh, continued to give steroids or different, different people were seeing them. Maybe they went to different clinics and they were continuing to get steroids uh, inappropriately rather than getting antifungals. And so this is why a good general rule. If you're watching this and you're a, you're a non-dermatologist, dermatologists know all about this, but if you're non-dermatologists or not as familiar with treating skin things, if you're trying a topical steroid on something that you think is maybe an inflammatory dermatosis or a rash and it doesn't get better, or it gets worse, that's a sign that probably you should consider doing a biopsy or referring the patient to a dermatologist to evaluate the patient and do a biopsy. Or if you're familiar with how to read them, doing a skin scraping to look for fungus, a KOH skin scraping prep, but it takes some practice and skill to know how to read those. I still find those difficult to read because I'm used to looking at fungus this way under the microscope, not the skin scraping prep. I've seen those, but I don't see them very often in my practice. So in any case, that's the general rule that if you're if you're thinking of treating a person uh, with an anti-inflammatory topical steroid for a rash and it doesn't get better in a short amount of time or it gets worse, then you really should consider dermatology referral or uh, and or skin biopsy depending on your level of comfort with doing skin biopsies so that it can be evaluated for fungus because otherwise it continues to get worse and worse, continues to look more and more confusing. And like I said, I've seen patients that sometimes uh, through a variety of unfortunate circumstances went for years being treated with repeated rounds of topical steroids and no one ever checked for fungus. And did that kill the patient? No. Did that cause them significant uh, morbidity and quality of life problems? Yes, it did. And I'll always remember that the one the one patient I was thinking of at first was was a child, uh, elementary school kid, and I saw her in fellowship and uh, in fellowship uh, as a pathology trained uh, person doing derm path fellowship. I went uh, to clinic uh, half days of clinic throughout much of my fellowship to learn what the clinical aspect of dermatology was, and that way I could match that with what I see patho under the microscope pathologically. And I remember walking through the waiting room and seeing this little girl with that bright red m multiple rings, polycyclic, weird looking rash that was noticeable to me just walking through the waiting room. And I thought, I didn't say anything, of course, but I thought, what on earth is that? And I bet that kid probably got teased at school, probably felt self-conscious. And I remember, I'll never forget the parents brought in a baggie with multiple different tubes of all sorts of different steroids that they have been given again and again by different people over time. And no one ever did a biopsy. And thankfully this child got referred to the dermatology clinic and on biopsy, this was, uh, this was dermatophyte fungus, just like we see here, it was tinea incognito. And once it was discovered, that's what it was, it was cleared up quickly with uh, antifungal treatment. 
So it's a really important lesson uh, in, in making sure we don't miss fungus. And so those, those lessons have taught me to look carefully and always try to think of fungus uh, because it's really easy to miss it. It's easy to overlook it if, if it's not on the, the mind of the treating clinician when they're doing the biopsy, it's easy to not think of it. If it microscopically has an unusual appearance like this case, look kind of like folliculitis or, or maybe like herpes zoster at first glance, uh, I definitely thinking of fungus was not the first thing on my mind when I first put this slide down. It only was after I looked around a little bit, then I saw the neutrophils, and then I thought, I wonder if there's fungus, and sure enough, there was, but uh, it did not stand out to me right away. So, and then it, my other rule is if there's any doubt or if the patient, if the, the dermatologist told me they were thinking of fungus, if it looked annular or ring-like clinically, if there's a history that they tried steroids and it didn't get better, or, a, or they did steroids and it got worse, or microscopically, if I see neutrophils in the stratum corneum or other microscopic clues to make me think of fungus, those are all things that will make me think of doing a fungal stain like a GMS or a PAS to make sure that I don't miss dermatophyte. And maybe part of it is because I carry the emotional trauma, so to speak, of thinking of those patients and how long they went uh, without being diagnosed, you know, and without getting the appropriate treatment. And once you find the fungus, it's usually a pretty easy uh, treatment for most patients. There are some exceptions, but... In any case, I just wanted to share that with you. I thought it was a really good example of a sneaky fungus. And again, microscopically, when I looked on H&E, I found a couple fungal hyphae up there, but look at how many were actually here. It's loaded. There's tons of fungus. It's everywhere. Look at that. So that, that's the other thing is that fungus, uh, the dermatophyte fungus is often totally clear on H&E. And I find that even cases like this that are loaded, it's often, even if I go and look carefully on the H&E, I may not be able to see them at all, or, or I may only be able to see rare fungus. I find that dermatophyte fungus on H&E stain is really difficult to see. Sometimes you'll see like a little hole in the stratum corneum. Sometimes you'll find a little tiny circle there of uh, fungal hyphae uh, in, the, in the stratum corneum, but oftentimes they're almost invisible, even when they're, look at, there's just numerous, look at how many there are numerous fungal organisms here, but they were still really difficult to see. And sometimes I see cases of uh, tinea dermatophyte fungus with like one fungal hypha in the stratum corneum. So the other thing is that when you're lucky, you put it down and you see on the fungal stain, loads of fungus, no problem, we're done. But if I don't see that, I don't just look quickly and say, oh, it's done. I, I try to look closer on a higher magnification and scroll along the stratum corneum here because I have had times where at first glance, I didn't see any fungus. And then when I look closer, I found one fungal organism. And again, that one fungal organism, that one hypha in the stratum corneum makes the difference of the diagnosis and totally changes the treatment. So anyway, I hope that you enjoyed that case and learned a few pearls uh, from it uh, because I've certainly uh, been surprised by some of these cases in my practice over time. All right. Uh, Miyake granuloma, fungal folliculitis, uh, caused by dermatophyte fungus. Hope you enjoyed. Thanks for watching and have a great day.